This was a very violent and pure evil crime. Brutally murdered and shoved under a house for 30 years. The body is mummified. The skin is like rubber. We realized that we would have to use the video spectral comparator. That kind of changed the course of the investigation. He says, I'm afraid of what you might find out. I said to him, I said, you know what we'll find out. And I'll put you in jail for the rest of your life. You understand that? But it never crossed my mind how this would wind up. I couldn't believe it. It was like she was waiting 30 years to tell somebody what had happened. My first thought was, what do you mean you think you have a dead body? It, we have a dead body, we don't have a dead body. It turns out, this was going to be one of the most interesting cases I had ever dealt with. The entire case actually took less than 10 days. When we arrived there, in front of the house was a big black barrel, 55-gallon drum. I spoke to the gentleman who had found it. Turned out that he was selling his house. He told me that on the previous day, the buyer of the house came by and decided he wanted to do one last walkthrough. He crawled under an extension to the house, all the way to the back corner. And he said, you have a barrel stuffed all the way in that back corner behind the steps. I don't know what's in that barrel. I want it out of here. So they rolled it all the way out, stood it up, and the owner said, you know, we'll open it and empty it so the garbage will take it. And that's what started the case. I went over to the barrel with my partner, and there's a seal that goes around the top of the barrel. He unbolted the strap, and we opened the barrel. The odor, the stench, was overpowering. The smell of a decomposing body is something that anyone who smells it will never forget it. It's a, a very, very pungent, sweet, sickening smell. Inside a barrel, there is what appears to be a human hand in a curled, position, buried in a very viscous, greenish fluid. I had no idea if we were just going to have a barrel full of limbs or if it was going to be a full body. So an autopsy is going to be performed.
this is going to be the day that's going to really tell us what we're dealing with. I've been to many autopsies where the body is decomposed. This body, having been closed in there for all these years, and when the AI got to it, it began to decompose very, very rapidly. It was very, very tough for the people who were there. The first thing that comes out of the barrel when it's tipped is a green fluid. We knew that this wasn't body fluids. This was something chemical. This was something that came probably with the barrel originally. It seemed to be a dye of some type. And there was a lot of this black and white viscous material. They appeared to be plastic pellets, black and white. The body was bent in half, hands to feet, head to knee. The body is mummified. The skin is like rubber. This was like something I'd never, ever uh, experienced before. A body found in an airtight drum is going to be relatively preserved from the elements. So that will take time for the body to decompose. The tissue is not being moved, it's not being sloughed off. There are no flies laying their maggots that are eating holes into the tissue. So essentially that body is allowed to mummify in that environment. The clothing is the hint of we're dealing with something quite a while ago. It looked like the clothing that would be from the 60s. And that's what we felt. Now we're really looking back in time. You know, we're looking back possibly 30 years at this time. We have no idea who this person is. But we're dealing with a very small, white, possibly Hispanic, obvious female with long black hair. She has a unusual gold-rimmed bridge in her mouth. She was wearing a gold-colored ring with a green stone. The cause of death is readily apparent. A skull is crushed by blunt force trauma. The medical examiner determined was seven to 10 blows with a hammer. Even worse, the deceased is pregnant. It was probably in the very latter stages, eight to possibly nine months in the pregnancy. She had been brutally murdered, killing her child also, and jammed into a barrel and shoved under a house for possibly 25 or 30 years. So we looked at this as a very violent and pure evil crime. During the course of the autopsy, several other items were located on or about the body. One of the things that comes out is about a four inch green plastic stem. No thought as to what it is at this point, but it is removed and put aside as possible evidence. And at the very bottom of the barrel is a pocketbook. Inside the pocketbook, there was a small address book, about three by five, that had been soaked in this fluid, and it couldn't be opened. We were afraid to open it, that we would destroy whatever was in there. So we asked for our document section people to come down, and we turned these items over to them.
they would inform me as soon as they would get anything. But they were a lot more optimistic than I was. Early the next day, I had all the records of every homeowner. My first thought was, if you were going to kill somebody, generally you wanted as far away from you and your house as possible. So I wanted to find out about this extension. Thinking that the construction people, who have barrels, could have very easily left that there during the building. My main interest from the get-go was the second homeowner, who, according to the paperwork, had the extension done. So I asked him about the extension that he built on a home. He, it tells me that when he purchased the house in 1972, that extension was there. He actually went under the crawl space, and he saw the barrel. But the barrel was so big and heavy and cumbersome, he couldn't move it. He just left it there, thinking that it was probably just construction waste. Now. Certainly, I, I'm not taking what he says uh, as 100% truthful. But then he informed me that he purchased the house from a, a man called Howard Elkins. And I asked him what he knew about Mr. Elkins. Uh, he told me that he was aware that Howard Elkins owned a, uh, a plastic flowers company. It immediately came to mind that we found a plastic, a green plastic stem and, and leaf in the barrel. This was very, very important. This seemingly insignificant little piece of plastic now puts it into a person who owns a plastic factory, and he had owned the house. So now we really have a, a hot lead. We had Howard Elkin's name. We ran it through the DMV system come up with a hit in Florida. Now we had his name and his address in Florida. Howard Elkins now becomes our main interest. But I can't just go down and accuse somebody and not have the answers. It's the old saying, you don't ask a question, you don't have the answer to it. So I wanted to know everything I possibly could about his work before we went to see him. Early the next day, I hear from my uh, documents people that they have made some progress with that address book that we had recovered from the barrel. The book was drying a little bit more and becoming a little more stable. But the entries in the address book were generally not visible for decipherment by the naked eye. They were faded because the paper fibers absorbed the bodily fluids. We realized that this was uh, a case that we would have to use the video spectral comparator. The instrument is used to detect counterfeit monies and fraudulent documents. It detects changes in the inks beyond what we can see with our naked eye. With the address book, we knew that there may be components of the ink that still remain that we may be able to visualize in the infrared range. So you'll start with the low end of the visible spectrum, and then as you move up closer to the infrared, you'll start to see different changes in the characteristics of the ink. Most of the time, we'll find a sweet spot, a particular wavelength that's most productive for us to decipher these entries. With the address book, one particular entry caught our interest because it was a number preceded by the letter A.
We didn't know what we were dealing with, but I thought right away it was a resident alien number because the victim looks Hispanic. So my partner started checking with INS, Immigration Bureau. But this is over 30 years ago. So they let us know in no uncertain terms. It's going to take some time to identify the victim. So you investigate what you can investigate. Everything we're doing now is with the thought of getting information on Mr. Elkins. I certainly don't think it's an accident that this green plastic stem was found inside a barrel. On the barrel, there was a large green sticker with the initials GAF. We found out that this was a chemical company located in New Jersey. So this now becomes our focal point for the next day. Early the next day, I made an appointment in New Jersey with the chemical company. I want to show them the green fluid. I want to show them the plastic pellets. When the detective arrived, I knew right away that the plastic was a polyethylene pellet, and it's fed into the machine that's used to injection mold various types of products, including plastic flowers. This is after I learned that Howard Elkins owned a plastic flower company. Now I'm being told that this type of pellet is used in that. The detective produced a stack of photographs of the drum. We knew all about it. The dye that was in the drum is called heliogen green. The one time that was produced back in the 60s, there was only one customer who bought product in that drum. A single company that had manufactured plastic flowers. So all these items, the dye, the pellets, the barrel, and the green plastic stem, they're all reflecting back to Howard Elkin, to the plastic flower company. So now, let's find out about the plastic factory. When the records came back, we found out that the name of the corporation was Melrose Plastics. Howard Elkins was a principal in this corporation. It was now closed, and he had moved on to Florida with his children and his wife. We found out that he was a partner with another gentleman at Melrose Plastic back in the 60s, and his name was Melvin Gantman. It turned out that Gantman lived nearby Elkins on the east coast of Florida. At that point, there's no doubt in my mind, we're going to Florida the next day. The next day, we got a flight. The plan was to speak to Howard Elkins. We're really on a chase now at this point in time to find him. But we decided to speak to Melvin Gantman first because we wanted to get as much insight into Elkins as we could get. We didn't know what his attitude was gonna be, but we were hopeful that he would be on our side. We asked him if he had a relationship with Howard Elkins. He indicated that he hadn't seen him in years. So he was willing to talk to us. We showed him a picture of the 55-gallon drum that our deceased had been found in. He immediately identified it. Immediately says, absolutely, that's the barrel we used in my company. There's a bung on the bottom of the barrel, and it was a halogen green dye in the barrel. We used it for the base of our plastic flowers. 
He's right on the money with everything. Absolutely. And then shortly after that, he had a very interesting piece of information that he gave us. He told us it was in the 1960s. Mr. Gammon was working at the Classic Flower Company. He recalled receiving a phone call from their landlord. He was trying to find Howard Elkin. Howard wasn't there that day. So the landlord said, well, will you tell him that I want him to get his girlfriend's furniture and clothing and stuff out of the apartment? The girl is not living here anymore. Please come and empty the apartment so I can re-rent it. So we asked him if he knew if Howard ever had a girlfriend. Gantman told us that he saw this woman that worked there together with Elkin. And he said, she was a young Spanish girl, very pretty. She had long black hair. She had strange gold teeth. She worked with us probably in 1966, 1967. Then she left, never to be seen again. I looked over at Bob, and we, our eyes kind of met like, can you believe what he remembers? And can you believe how important what he's telling us is? Now we knew that Howard Elkins, who was a married man with kids, was having an affair, probably with the victim. We were high-fiving one another when we left the house. We said, we got it. This is it. It's a done deal. Let's go get him, you know? This case is coming together. It's six days old. You know, 30 years in a barrel, six days. We're going to put this away right now, today. That's how we felt at that point in time. We're heading over to Howard Elkin's house, and, and we're as happy as can be. Absolutely convinced we know who did, the, who did the killing. Brian and I were both very electrified by the information that we just got from Gantman. The whole thing is coming into form. It, it's, it's, it's gelling right now. This was it. This was going to be the most important interview in the entire case. We walked up to the house, knocked on the door. Mr. Elkin. When he answers the door, I have my shield out. I told him we're from Nassau County Homicide Squad, and we were investigating a homicide that involved his home. OK, come on. He invited us in. We had a seat. We started to talk to him. So we started off, as we always do, just in conversation. There were no accusations. Started talking to him about Melrose Plastic. At this point, we showed him a photo of the barrel and asked him if he recognized the barrel. He said, no, absolutely not. I asked him, is this the type of barrel that you would have used in your, your company? And he said, no, never saw anything like that. We ran through the whole litany that he had a plastics business. He said, I, I never saw anything like that in my business. So we knew he was lying at that time. I indicated that we knew that there was a dye in the barrel and that the dye was called a halogen green. Told us he never heard of it. When he denied that, it was like, this is going to be tough. He's not going to go for anything. But then he surprised us, because we asked him about if he ever had an affair with anybody. Yeah. And he said he did. He indicated that it was a very, very short affair, and she left work. She stopped working there, so it was the end of it. And that was it. We would asked him point blank, was she pregnant when she left? No. Absolutely not. It was so insignificant that he didn't remember her name. He couldn't describe her. It, it was just like smoke, you know? Now we got to the point where 
We literally told them, look, we're not here by accident. We've been doing this case for five or six days now. Everything points to you. I'm going to tell you right now, that barrel comes from your business. No, it doesn't. Now comes the moment of truth. I said to him, okay, there was a dead girl found in that barrel and she was pregnant. I want to take a swab from the inside of your cheek and I'm going to match up the DNA to that fetus. If you don't match, you walk. No. He says, I watch too much television. He said, I, I, I know you guys could do all kinds of stuff with that. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And then lo and behold, the phone rang. It was his wife calling, and she was on her way home. At that point, I knew there was not a doubt in my mind that he was the murderer, and I knew he knew we knew. When he got off the phone, he told us, he said, look, that was my wife. She's on her way home. I don't want you here when she gets here. We have a lot to discuss. I want you to leave. Now, we have no choice. I didn't have a warrant. And I have no arrest powers there. So I stood up right next to him. I stood right in front of him. I said, I'm going to tell you something, Miss Elkins. We're going to leave. But I'm going to get a warrant for your DNA. I'm going to get your DNA. I'm going to match it up to that dead baby and that dead woman. And I'll put you in jail for the rest of your life. Do you understand that? And he just imperceptibly, a nod. And that was it. Now we knew he was the guy that ended her life and let her spend 30 years in a barrel under a house. I was absolutely sure I would have enough to get an arrest warrant. But it never crossed my mind how this would wind up. We spent the entire next day on the phone with our district attorney because I don't have arrest power out of state without a warrant. But the next day was the Jewish holidays, and a lot of the people are going to be off because of the holiday. So he says, you may have to wait till Monday. We'd done everything we could do. Uh, we weren't going to get a court order that day. So we basically had free time for Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, which we were planning to go fishing. Nothing else to do. It looks to us like a done deal at this point in time, and we're really, really happy about it. So I said to Brian, you know, we ought to call the office, let them know what's going on, meaning our office in New York. So he went to the phone, and he called the office. The detective there, who he's speaking to, says, do you guys have Howard Elkin? So what do you mean, we have Elkins? I said, no, of course we don't have him. He says, well, the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department just called here looking for you guys to see if you had Howard Elkin. What? It turns out Mrs. Elkin was reporting her husband missing. So we went to the sheriff's office. As we were arriving, the deputy came outside and I said, are you guys from Nassau? He said, look, they found him. Early that afternoon, Howard Elkins went to the local Walmart, purchased a 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun. And he went to a neighbor's house. He went into the garage. He went into the back seat of the neighbor's car and took his own life with the shotgun. A 
I couldn't believe it. We went from the high of thinking we're going to make the arrest to all of a sudden, he's dead. I was disappointed because I wanted him to go to jail. I was disappointed because I wanted to arrest him and put him on trial. He pulled the rug out from under us by committing suicide. We were deflated that, that night. The only bonus that we had in the whole case at that time was the fact that we now had Howard Elkins' blood that we could, could do a DNA test on. If we're trying to establish if an individual is the father of a child, what we're looking for are these, we call them alleles. These are the different choices of DNA that we can find. If the father, or the person we believe to be the father, doesn't have that particular allele that's present in the child, then they cannot be a contributor. If they do have the allele at all the locations we're looking at, we can calculate the likelihood of that profile coming from an unrelated individual. And it's that calculation that gives us something we call the paternity index. I was certainly hopeful that they were going to match up the DNA with the fetus in the deceased. They would inform me as soon as they would get anything, but it's going to take some time. We flew back to New York. So I returned to work on Monday and the package from the immigration services came. And now we know who our victim is. Raina Angelica Marican. She emigrated in 1966 from El Salvador. She was a beautiful young woman. And just days before, during the autopsy, when we looked at her, it was a shriveled up, mummified thing that you would never think was this beautiful, vibrant young woman. So we have now reached a point in this investigation where we have a million questions still about how did this happen? When did it happen? So finding someone who could answer 90% of our questions was an absolute cherry on top. Earlier that afternoon, the document team told me that they had come up with quite a few numbers in the phone book of a deceased. We were able to continue to work on the address book while Brian was out in the field conducting his investigation. We were deciphering the pages and perfecting our methodology. To... We found a lot of names and phone numbers. Once we provided them with that information, that kind of changed the course of the investigation. So we started calling the numbers. But all these numbers come from the 60s. We're sorry, the number you have so they all good. came back. It's been disconnected, or you've dialed incorrectly. But my partner takes one number and dials it, and a person answers. That is shocking in itself. He said, where does this number go to? She says, well, it goes to the garment district in, in New York City. Well, how long have you been there? She said, well, I've been here for 40 years. She identifies herself as uh, Kathy Andrade. So without saying anything further on the phone, we make an appointment to see her the following day. That next day, when, when I heard Kathy's story, I couldn't believe it. It was too good to be true. It was like she was waiting 30 years to tell somebody what had happened. into the city the following day 
with the full intention of speaking with Kathy Andrade at the Garment Center. We showed her the picture, a very an American, and she went completely, immediately to tears. She was a friend. Kathy, she referred to her as my angel. Her middle name was Angelica. She then recited the story to us that literally answered 90% of the questions we had. It was November 1968. She and Angelica would talk almost every day. At one point, Angelica tells her that she's pregnant, and she's pregnant by her boss at the Plastic Flower Company. He was going to take care of her. They were going to get married, and he put her in an apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is just across the river. She informs us that a period of time goes by and she gets a panic call. Kathy says, I get a call late one day from Angelica and she's crying on the phone. I ask her what, what the problem is and she says she did something very foolish. So Kathy says to Angelica, what did you do? I did a terrible thing. I, I called my boyfriend's wife and I told her that I was pregnant with his baby, and now he's going to kill me. So Angelica said, will you please come and help? She said, I never heard from her again. She was genuinely, genuinely upset, uh, knowing that probably that day, Angelica was killed. And I know without her having to say it, wondering if there was something more she could have done. It was amazing. The case was backwards, you know? We were looking for all this evidence in the beginning, and we didn't have anything. So the whole thing came together at the end. And then the DNA was the, uh, that was the icing on the cake. At the end of the case, I got a report from LabCorp on the DNA matchup. The results came back with 99.93 percentage that, that Howard Elkin was the father of the fetus. And that was basically case really closed, nailed shut at that time. So in less than 10 days, we solved a case that in actuality was more than 30 years old. I'm proud of the work that we all did on this case. I'm proud that we solved it. Uh, but it does leave a slight empty feeling. I think there was certainly, through our investigation, there was justice brought for Raina. Although we didn't arrest him, 
and try him and put him in jail. Howard Elkins went to his grave knowing that he was caught. He led his life. He watched his family grow up. He had 30 years with his wife and his kids. And she was buried in a barrel under a house for 30 years. And no one, with the exception of Kathy Andrade, missed her.